Hello everyone. It's time to look at some of these mystery boxes. I've been going slightly mad not knowing what's inside of these machines. And they all look like either custom builds or maybe some small time computer manufacturers. And they all look to be either late 80s or early to mid 90s. Alright, well it's finally time to remedy my madness, so let's tear into these. Alright, I'm going to start with this machine, since it's the only one with a CD-ROM drive. Could get interesting. Can't find anything on that manufacturer. Guessing that's either an ultra small time clone manufacturer or that's just the manufacturer of the case. Got our reset turbo and power buttons here. And they're all doing what they're supposed to do. And these drives are in fairly good condition. The CD drive's got a little bit of yellowing here, but I think for the most part it's just dirty. And having a look around the back, we can see it's an AT system. Got the AT keyboard port there. Got our game and 25 pin serial ports there. And we have an interesting looking sound card there. Very curious to know what that is. Got some kind of video card, and our standard serial and parallel ports. Alright, let's open this thing up. This case has two screws on each side holding it together, so let's get those out of there. Okay, now with those out of there, it looks like we just slide back. Yeah, there we go. And pull that off. Whoa, what is going on with that CPU? Evergreen Technologies. If I remember correctly, that was a manufacturer of CPU upgrade kits. And yeah, it looks like that's what that is. It's sitting on a PCB. Oh, I gotta get that thing out of there and check that out. Looks like I gotta pull this drive cage, so let's go ahead and get these disconnected. And it looks like these three remaining screws get this drive cage out, so let's get those out of there. Okay, now hopefully we can just pull this out of here. It's sure hanging on there. There we go. Alright, let's check that thing out. Hmm, no part numbers on the bottom of it. I really don't want to have to pull this heatsink off. But I don't see any kind of part numbers or anything. Okay, yeah, there's no way I'm going to attempt to pull this heatsink off, so I'm just going to leave it in there for now and see if I can identify it with software. If I had to guess, it's probably a 586 upgrade. And that sound card seems to suggest that this is some kind of Franken system, clearly harvested from a Packard Bell. Sure looks like an Aztec card to me. And, hiding behind that cable, got an OPL3 chip. Awesome, this system's full of treasures. Let's go ahead and liberate this sound card. Pull this serial cable connector. And here's a closer look at it. Backside's pretty clean. Just need to do some gentle cleaning on that edge connector. I wonder what's going on with this bodge wire here. That sure looks like a factory bodge. Let's put that in a safe spot. Oh, that video card's also a treasure. Diamond Speedstar Pro. Year marked as 1996. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. This is starting to look like somebody's mid-90s gaming machine. Pretty clean little card. Let's get that in the safety zone. And there's our I.O. card. It's got an Acer chipset. Let's go ahead and get that out of there. Here's a good look at that. Looks like an Acer M5105. Pretty clean little card. Wait, this is a VLB system? This system is just full of surprises. Yeah, check it out, we got three VLB slots. Oh, this motherboard is definitely in the wrong case. Yeah, that riser is definitely ISA only. Yeah, this motherboard definitely deserves to be either in a tower or a full height desktop case. Okay, I don't think I can get any luckier with this system, but Hiding way down there, got a coin cell battery. And that means our great nemesis, the Varta battery, has not conquered this motherboard. That is a beautiful sight. Oh, but it gets even better. We are fully loaded with 15 nanosecond CPU cache chips. We got the tag chip down there. And here's a good look at the BIOS chip. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get this speaker out of the way because I need to pull that riser. I'm just gonna put this to the side for right now. All right, let's get this riser out of here because it's definitely in my way for replacing that battery. And there it is. Let's just put that to the side. I'm just going to leave this crossbar in here for now because I'm going to have to remove the faceplate in order to get it off because it's got a little screw that shoots this way. Let me just knock some of this dust off with an anti-static brush. Now let's get that battery replaced. It's just a regular old CR2032. All right, let's get all these cables out of the way.
And we're using both 30-pin and 72-pin SIM modules. And fortunately, we have metal clips here, so they're less likely to break. Let's go ahead and get that 72-pin module out of there. That sticker says 1 meg, but it sure looks like a 4 meg stick to me. Let's put that to the side. All right, all those 30-pin SIMs look identical. Let's check out the first one. And that's also a 1 meg stick. Let's see the next one. And that's an identical 1 meg stick. Third one is the same. And finally, same, same. All right, so all the 30-pin modules match. All right, let's check those tantalum caps for shorts. Good on that side. And we're good there. All right, let's check out that CD drive. I can already see it's a Matsushita. Manufactured February 1994. Someone definitely brought the war to that audio cable. All right, got all those drive screws out, so... And there it is. Model CR563-B, same model as those creative drives. And here's the back side of the drive. I'm actually going to put that back in there, because I want to see if it works. And here's a look at the hard drive. Got an 850 megabyte Western Digital Caviar. Manufactured November 1995. And here's a look at the logic board. Say, this floppy drive has that same style of sticker as the RAM sticks have. So maybe this was some kind of small-time computer manufacturer. And clearly I'm the first person to open this floppy drive up, so... Goodbye warranty. That is one sticky label. Pretty dirty in here. Now let's clean up those heads. Well, not terribly dirty. All right, got sacrificial hard drives connected. Still won't die. Let's see if this is the one that finally finishes them off. Here we go. That little fan is loud. Just gonna let that run for five minutes. All right, that is time. All right, let's see what this thing does. Here we go. Hard drive initialized. And we are posting. Yes, indeed. All right, let's go ahead and run setup. And it's got WinBIOS on it. Well, that WinBIOS sure found its way into a lot of things back then. Ooh, do we have auto detection? Yes, indeed, we do. Well, that's convenient. That looks correct. Let's make sure that floppy drive's configured. We are installed. All right. Save, changes, and exit. Okay, that was weird. But we are booting. Windows 95? They had Windows 95 on this thing? Uh-oh. Okay, let's see if we can just get through this. That hard drive sounds awesome. Ooh, what is that? That is a very funky mouse cursor. What the? <laughs> that was quite the startup sound. Alright, we are in. This is a very scientific Windows theme they have here. What is after dark? Wow, this thing's running incredibly slow. Okay, what is this even? Let's see, demo. Okay. Okay, that was kind of... That's kind of spooky. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. Okay, so I'm guessing it's like a screensaver thing. Wow, is this thing running slow? Let's see what else is on here. That sound was delayed. Oh yeah, this was definitely a kid's computer. Although on second thought, it looks like it was a shared computer. Let's see what's in the broader bun folder. Oh, it's empty. It doesn't look like there's any non-kids games. Guitar Teacher 2.0. Now I can finally learn how to play that thing. What is CD Speedster? Okay, so I guess it's just a CD-ROM caching software. It does sound vaguely familiar. I swear I've heard of that before. Speaking of the CD-ROM, let's test that thing. 
Well, it opens right up. Let's just give that a quick de-dusting. And looks like it works. Yes, indeed. All right. Let's not continue on with that. All right, how about the floppy drive? Weird, it's got a red LED. Unfortunately not. Oh well. Oh, maybe that's why we're going so slow. Engage turbo mode. Oh yeah, we're a lot snappier now. All right, let's see what else we got on here. Not a whole lot of games. That's pretty surprising for the hardware that this thing has. Let's see, what's in heart? Is that a game? Nope. Some kind of Mayo Clinic thing. I gotta see what that is. That's just too interesting looking. Well, it doesn't work. Oh well. Ooh, that was a nasty sound. Okay. I'm missing my Total Heart CD. Ah, uh, forget it. It's in Fortel 6. Okay, well, whatever that is. Not a game, apparently. And of course it has AOL 2.5 on it. And of course I just have to look. Doesn't look used. Oh, but we have sound now. So I can do this. Welcome. <laughs> wow, I haven't heard that in forever. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> What follows welcome? You've got mail. <laughs> ah. Oh, the IM sound. That just unlocked so many core memories. I'm done. Jeez, I forgot about that one. What is drop? I think that's the sound I made when you added favorites. Yeah, I think so. Boy, it's been a while. Well, that's enough of that. Goodbye. All right, let's drop down to DOS mode and check out that hard drive. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is up with these sounds? Skip undo. Okay, not too much file system trouble. Proceed to surface scan. Well, I've never seen that interface be so noisy. All right, I think we're gonna win. Yep, healthy little hard drive. All right, now I gotta get DOS Bench and a few games on here. And my favorite way to do that is with good old zip disks. There we go. All right, let's get back to DOS mode and do some benchmarks. All right, let's get some system information first. Let's see what that CPU identifies as. Whoa, that's a Cyrix CPU. No way, that's my first Cyrix CPU. I sure hope that's accurate. It is reporting that it has an 8387 Mathco. Let's jump out of here and do CPU check. Yeah, that says the same thing. Claims to be a Cyrix CPU. I'm just gonna go ahead and believe that. <laughs> All right, let's see what Landmark says. Ah, no EMM386 configured. Oh well. All right, let's see if the Doom benchmark runs. I'm gonna go with max details. Well, it's not running great. Okay, that works out to a little under 15 FPS. So yeah, not great. Let's see if speed sys will run. Might have to boot into actual DOS. Well, hard drive's going. All right, let's get out of here. Let's see what top bench says. Well, that doesn't run. Let's try to run cache check. Okay, well this says it's clocked at 113 megahertz. Definitely getting some conflicting information here. So just as a matter of curiosity, let's run that again without turbo enabled. Turbo off. And yeah, we dropped down to 27.8 megahertz, as expected. Yeah, Doom's running pretty bad in Windows too. 486DX4 should definitely run better than this. still somewhat playable though. Okay, so there are several jumper blocks that claim to do Cyrix specific things. 
I tried a few things out, but still getting pretty bad performance. And I can't find this motherboard revision on the retro web. This is definitely one of the earlier revisions. So I'll have to get this motherboard uploaded to that as soon as I can. I just noticed this motherboard is mere millimeters from destruction. There's no standoffs on this part of the board, so it's kind of right there, ready to short out on the case. And don't worry, I don't have power anywhere near this thing right now. Pretty sketchy. All right, well, I cannot be happier with how this thing turned out. Thing is just absolutely loaded with goodies. I'll just have to do some more digging on getting that Cyrix CPU to perform correctly. And that motherboard is definitely not staying in that case. That's certainly not the last you'll be seeing of that motherboard. A little short on time this week, so I'm going to save the case cleaning for whenever I decide to transplant that motherboard. Let's move on to the next system. Alright, next system is this Cumulus GLC. Now this company actually has a wiki page. They weren't around for very long though. They started out in 1987 manufacturing expansion cards for the IBM PS2, then moved on to start producing their own systems around 1990, and they went belly up in 1993. So yeah, pretty short-lived company. And of course we have our reset and turbo buttons here, both doing what they're supposed to do. Got a pair of color matched three and a half inch and five and a quarter inch drives. I'm assuming they're original to the system because they definitely fit the look. And got our power button here. And here's the back side of the machine. Of course it's an AT system. Looks like we've got onboard serial and VGA here. And I'm guessing this is an IO card with our standard serial and parallel ports. All right, looks like three screws get us in with only two remaining. So let's crack this thing open. All right, we are unscrewed. Now it looks like this just slides back. Awfully tight. Just hanging on there. Whoa, what on earth is going on in here? Let me get you a better camera angle. Okay, this thing is definitely funky. It looks like the entirety of the system is contained on just this card. Oh, that is so weird. Let's go ahead and pull that thing out of there. Let's get these plethora of cables disconnected from here. Okay, so now I'm guessing it just pulls out like a regular ISA card. Yeah, this is definitely a new one for me. I can see it's a 386SX. 16 megahertz, and this looks like the VGA portion. It looks like it actually can just be pulled off. Let's try that. Aha, I was wondering where the battery was. Got an RTC module there. If you don't know, these contain an internal battery, and that battery is most likely dead. And that's definitely gonna have to be desoldered, and there is most certainly not enough room to put it in a socket. But here is what I assume is the VGA card. It interfaces with these pin headers. I'm gonna guess that this is just ISA in pin header form. Let's put that to the side. I just can't get over this. I've seen single board systems before, but definitely not like this. So these SIM slots are the all plastic design and they're generally very brittle. So I'm just gonna leave those alone. I'm gonna see if this thing will boot with the dead RTC. If not, I'll desolder it and do the battery calculation. I'm definitely going to have to route the batteries somewhere off board. I usually mount them on the top, but there is definitely not going to be enough room. So let's get that VGA board back on. And what remains is just a bunch of wiring and passive components on that board. And an ISA riser, of course. It's got a total of five ISA slots, with only four being usable. Got an Epson SMD300 floppy drive. That's the same drive that's in those Gateway 2000s. Let's go ahead and pull that out of there. They were definitely serious about their grounding in this thing. Some very creative bracketry going on here. Looks like we only got one screw on this side and a single screw on the other side. Now I'm guessing it pulls towards the back. Uh -huh, there we go. I love the way these Epson drives come apart. Just got a single screw here and then the entirety of the outer metal pulls off. Man, it's actually really clean in there. But as always, gonna clean the heads. Probably wasn't even necessary. Now let's do the five and a quarter inch drive. And this is also an Epson drive, SD600. And it's also pretty clean. It's got a little bit of dust buildup, but very little dust buildup. Let's get this top plate off. Yeah, super clean in there. Let's just clean those heads. Also, probably not even necessary. This thing has an old boy Western Digital Caviar, and it does not look easy to remove. Let's start by getting these cables off of it. And it's even got a Western Digital branded IDE cable. 
Now, let's figure out how on earth do I get this out of here. There's no way it can go through the front because that's just all metal. I might have to remove the power supply. Aha, oh, there's just barely not enough room. But I see what I can do. I can cheat. Because now I can get to the screws that hold the drive in the bracket. Aha! Look at this, it's so old that the LED is connected to the hard drive itself. 85 megabytes. That should be enough for anyone, right? Manufactured February 4th, 1991. And there's the logic board. IDE drive, of course. I've never seen right angle AT power connectors before. Alright, let's go ahead and test that power supply. Got the sacrificial hard drives as a dummy load, of course. Here comes power. Well, that's not good. Yeah, that power supply is dead dead. Hopefully it didn't take anything out with it. Alright, due to time constraints, I've gone with the alternative external power supply configuration. But I've got everything reinstalled, so it's time to see what this thing does. Power on. And we are posting! Got a seek on both drives. And no surprise, the RTC is dead. Let's go into the setup utility. Hit any key to continue. Where's the any key? <laughs> Alright, hard drive type. Okay, I've gone through this three times and I don't see these drive parameters in there. And I do not see any way to manually enter these. What is up with that? Okay, apparently type 48 and 49 are user configurable. 980 cylinders, 10 heads, nothing for right pre-comp or landing zone, 17 sectors, and that looks close enough. Let's see if we can change that to VGA. There we go. Okay, I guess F10 didn't save. Let's try a reboot. Hmm, still angry. And all my settings are gone. So is it the escape key? Doesn't look like it. Yeah, we're probably gonna have to hack that RTC. Let's try continuing. And that's a no. Well, let's just try a DOS boot disk. Alright, three and a half inch drive works. Alright, do we have a C drive? Nope. Yeah, we're definitely not remembering the parameters. Well, time to get that RTC off of there. Alright, the upshot is I get to use my new desoldering gun. Gotta give a huge thanks to my patron James Kearns Jr. for providing me with this. This thing is awesome. I am still getting used to using it, so just keep that in mind if you see me struggle a bit. I am still going to use the desoldering alloy, just because it makes it that much easier. I've already got a bead of flux run on all the RTC pins. Alright, now I get to use the gun. Okay, now should just pull off. Just like that. Don't know how I ever lived without this thing. Thanks again, James. And now we hackulate. All we have to do is drill a hole above where pins 16 and 20 should be. Just drill until you see metal. And that gives you access to the internal battery terminals, which you can then solder an external battery to. In this case, the RTC needs a pretty low profile, so I went with this external CR2032 battery pack. So now all that's left to do is seal it up with some hot glue. Alright, got that soldered back on. Added a few strategic dabs of hot glue, and I've just velcroed the battery to the bottom of the case. I would have put it on top of the card, but it definitely would have interfered with any future ISA cards. And I just noticed how perilously close this connector is to shorting out on this floppy drive bracket. <laughs> it is just right there. Not even a millimeter. Sure hope that's a ground pin. And this floppy drive bracket's riveted in place, so I can't even move it. Let's just go ahead and get a wad of electrical tape in there. I folded it up like six or seven times. Just in case. Alright, once again. We're on setup once more. Alright, no longer complaining about a dead battery. Now we get to do this all over. Alright, see what that gets us. Aha! There we go. We are booting to the hard drive. And <laughs> it's got Windows 3.1. Alright, we've got an ancient version of Microsoft Word on there. Let's see if it's got the basic Windows games on it. Oh hey, it's got Reversi on it. <laughs> Let's see what we got in applications. Norton Utilities. Wow, it's been so long I barely even remember that. And it's broken. Oh well. Had an HP DeskJet printer at one time. Alright, let's see if there's anything in DOS. 
Looks like this drive is a little over half full. Alright, looks like we got errors. This being DOS 5, we don't have scan disk. So let me get my DOS 622 boot disk back in there. And reboot to that. Alright, let's check out that hard drive. Skip undo, of course. Alright, let's do a surface scan. Man, this thing needs a defrag. Alright, I think we're gonna win. Yes, indeed. Those old Western Digitals continue to amaze me. Alright, let's test that five and a quarter inch drive. That's a good sign. <laughs> Alright, that drive works. Let's make sure it writes. And indeed it does. Very nice. Okay, well not a whole lot left to see on here. Let's check out that ancient version of Word. Microsoft Word 6.0. And yep, it's Word. Let's see if there's any documents on it. And yes, there are. Well, won't be poking around in there. I wonder what this file backup utility is. Huh, interesting. Alright. Let's shut this thing down. Alright, well with the exception of a bad power supply, got a fully functional system here. Kind of no surprise given how remarkably clean it is inside. I suspect this machine doesn't have very many hours of use on it. And even though it's kind of quirky and weird hardware-wise, it's actually a really well-built system. It's a shame that company went under. Let me know in the comments if you have any experience with these Cumulus systems. I'm really curious to know if they were popular at all. Alright, let's move on to the next system. Okay, so I initially thought that this system was some kind of custom build, but I took a closer look and it's actually from a company called Reason Technology Incorporated. And this particular model is called the Square 3, as indicated by the three squares there, obviously. But we've got our turbo reset and key lock here, got two vertical 3.5 inch drive bays here, and three 5 and a quarter inch drive bays. And the power switch is actually on the back side of the machine, and it's actually a pretty satisfying little switch. And it is of course an AT system, has all the usual ports, like the 25 pin serial port, has two parallel ports, standard 9 pin serial port, Got some kind of video card. And this here looks like a bus mouse connector or maybe Microsoft import. And here's a good look at that label. I cannot find any information whatsoever on this company, but we can see it supposedly has a 25 megahertz 386. Top of this case is pretty wrecked. I might break out the HVLP spray gun and try to reshoot this at some point. All right, we're completely unscrewed now. And it looks like this case moves forward. Yep, there we go. Oh, that hard drive is awesome looking. I gotta pull that out of there first. Yeah, that thing just looks like it sounds awesome. Looks like these two screws get us out. I've already got the IDE cable and power disconnected. So we should just pull out. Whoa, what is this thing? Looks like it might be either a Seagate or an old Connor drive. Aha, yeah, it's a Connor. Connor CP-3104. And there's the logic board. I just love that it's shock mounted. I bet that means it's a noisy one. My favorite. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and put that back in there. Honestly, I can't believe the luck I'm having with these three systems. Not a single one had a Varta battery. This one has an external battery pack. 3.6 volt lithium, most likely dead. Let's just go ahead and pull that out of there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this floppy drive and get this drive cage out of the way. Oh, it's got the math coprocessor! Awesome! Yeah, check that out! Got a 386DX with the math coprocessor. Oh, I am definitely falling in love. <laughs> Alright, let's check out these peripheral cards. I'm gonna start with this mouse card. And look at that, it's a Logitech card. Year marked as 1987. And here's a good look at that port. I don't think I have any mice that fit that connector. And here's the back side of the card. Pretty clean. Put that in the safe spot. All right, let's check out that video card. And it's a chips card. Here's a close look at that chipset. Hopefully it comes through pretty well in the video. I just love finding computer components that say made in West Germany. Back side looks good. Let's put that to the side. All right, let's disconnect this IO card.
and it's got a sys chipset 82c452 pretty clean as well and interestingly enough that parallel port is a separate card those are usually breakout shields archive sc402 controller so i wonder if this is for like an external tape driver or something definitely looks like a regular parallel port Gonna have to do some digging on that. And we got four sticks of 30 pin SIM RAM with all plastic clips, so I am not touching those. All right, let's clear these cables out of here. Let's get this power supply disconnected and ready for interrogation. Now with all those cables out of the way, we can get a good shot of this motherboard. And here's a good shot of the BIOS chips. This thing has chips, chips all over. We got the keyboard BIOS there, manufactured the same year I was. Now, can anybody tell me what this connector is for? I know it looks like an ISA slot, but why is it at the front of the case? That Gateway 2000 I did a few weeks ago had that same connector, and I had absolutely no luck in figuring out what it actually does. That power supply is pretty cool too. It's a 200 watt C-Sonic. It's pretty tall too. It's almost the whole height of the case. Sure hope it works. All right, let's get that five and a quarter inch drive out of there. Pretty dusty, but not too bad. Spindle's not stuck. And it's a Mitsubishi drive, manufactured in 1989. Let's just give it the usual sprucing up. Get all these dust bunnies out of there. And clean up the heads per usual. Not bad, not bad. The three and a half inch drive is also a Mitsubishi. That must have been the OEM for this company. It is unfortunately a little bit broken here. It's supposed to have little clips that reach along and clip to this metal. Those are gone. Shouldn't be a huge deal. I'm just gonna go ahead and remove that face plate the rest of the way for now. Got quite a few dust bunnies in here too. And let's clean up those heads. Very good. Yeah, that case was definitely designed around that power supply. So let's hope it works. Here we go. Got a bad connection on my 5 volt meter. There we go. All right, let's give it the usual five minutes. Hope everything goes well. All right, I think it passed. All right, I just checked those tantalum caps for shorts, and we're all good. All right, so I just repurposed that DuPont connector from the old battery. Got it attached to a regular CR2032, so let's get that in there. Hey, it's even compatible with the original Velcro. How about that? All right, I got everything reinstalled. Let's see what this thing does. It sounds like it's counting RAM. And it's posting. Counting RAM very slowly. Let's try to push the turbo button. Nope. <laughs> Apparently turbo was already enabled. That's as fast as it gets. Four megs of RAM. All right, got a seek on both drives. Well, I guess a single CR2032 is not enough for that. Didn't think those things drew so much current. Let's just see if it'll work for now. Okay, so I'm guessing it's standard setup. Okay, I think the three and a half inch drive is the B drive, so let's set that. Now, one little problem. The parameters for that hard drive are not written on it. Gotta see if I can search them based on the model. All right, so I'm just gonna plug in what I found on Google. 776 cylinders. Eight heads, nothing for right pre-comp or landing zone, 33 sectors, and that works out to about 100 megabytes. So let's see how it likes that. Okay, let's skip that RAM test this time. Oh no, it won't let me skip. Oh, there we go. Okay, I guess we have to configure the extended CMOS too. Let's go with the easy one because I have no idea what I'm doing in here. Well, that is a scary warning. All right, let's continue. Okay, guess it won't let me change that memory configuration. Okay, well, maybe I'll be happy enough with this. Let's see what's in advanced. Let's see how advanced it really is. Oh, that's definitely advanced. Back up. All right, let's write that out and see what it does. All right, it's booting with a very messed up auto exec dot bat. Wow, it's got DOS 4 on it. Okay, well, it's either very busy or it's frozen. 
Okay, yeah, I gave it a good five minutes and we're still frozen, so let's try a DOS boot disk. Alright, well that five and a quarter inch drive works. We are in IBM DOS. Now let's see if we have C drive. Yes, we do. Wow, there's a lot of stuff on there. Whoa, the park command. I remember the park command. You would run that command right before you shut down your computer and it would literally park the hard drive heads. Well, we definitely don't need that on this fancy new IDE drive. All right, well, let's get back to A drive. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on with that autoexec.bat. Okay, apparently it has windows on it. It's odd that the win command is above the mirror command. I definitely saw the mirror command try to run. Let's just try rimming out these last two lines. Save that and exit. Before I go though, let's check out that three and a half inch drive. And it works! Oh cool, it's got a red LED too. Just like the five and a quarter inch drive. Yeah, check it out. They both have red LEDs. I don't know why a red LED on a disk drive just gets me. I'm so used to them being green. Alright, well both disk drives work. Let's see if we can get the hard drive to boot properly. Let's get all those disks out of there. And reboot. Alright, that did it. So all those bad commands must have been the Windows commands. I guess Windows is no longer on here? Yep, it's gone. Alright, well let's see what is on here. It's just a bunch of Windows programs. Let's see, what's in no? <laughs> okay, that's a definite no. What is in nuts? Okay, it's just a document. Boring. Alright, let's run check disk on that thing. Okay, I guess that missing Windows install is due to file system corruption. Didn't specify the slash F parameter, so it doesn't really matter what I do here. Let's say yes. Jeez, you got some serious file system corruption on this thing. And not enough free space to fix it all. This hard drive is almost completely full. Don't even know what to begin to delete. Let's see what's in DFX. It's nothing I recognize. Let's just try running check disk again in for realsies mode. Yes, fix it all. That hard drive is incredibly quiet. I find that offensive. I thought that thing would be way noisier. Even with my ear right up to it, I can barely hear it. I didn't think we had such advanced hard drive quieting technology in 1989. And yeah, same story. Not enough free space. You know, it hasn't complained about that CMOS battery since that first boot. I think it's fine. Okay, I booted up to DOS 622. Let's see what ScanDisk has to say about that hard drive. Yeah, we got problems. Let's see if we can fix it. Boy, it's taking a while. Well, that's not good. Hopefully it can still do a surface scan. If not, I'm just gonna blow away that file system. Yeah, no surface scan for us. Let's see if it likes this combination. Yeah, we're not getting a surface scan. Not even enough free space for the log file. Alright, that file system has way too many problems. I'm just gonna blow it away. Yes, kill it all. Alright, well luckily it didn't find any bad sectors. But let's do a surface scan anyway to make sure. Uh oh. Oh, it hung up for a second. I thought it found a bad sector. That was kind of weird though. And there it goes again. That is very strange. So the format command normally finds and marks bad sectors. I wonder why it keeps hanging up like that. Unless those are parts of the disk that are about to go bad. Alright, we're gonna make it. Yup. I guess we'll know for sure if those sectors are gonna go bad once this disk starts doing some actual work. Okay, so I installed the four sticks of 30-pin SIMRAM from the first system. And amazingly, none of those clips broke. This RAM should have no problem working in this system, but let's see. Okay, well, it's counting it. Ah, oh, this is gonna take forever. Let's see if we can skip. All right, yeah, I got eight megs now. And it's mad. Gotta run setup utility. And I'm guessing that's the extended setup. It's like having to go talk to the boss every time you make a change. Okay, so I guess it just wants an acknowledgement. Who knows? Let's just write CMOS registers and exit. Okay, what does it want me to do here? Let's just run standard setup. Well, that's not good. Jeez, all this just to add some RAM. I'm just gonna let it go through a little slow count here. Maybe it'll figure its life out. But no love. Alright, I guess I gotta figure this setup program out. 
All right, we're gonna try the forced amnesia approach. I just disconnected the CMOS battery for a while. So let's see if it forgot all about that four megabytes. Let's get in the setup. And that's a no. Wow, this thing really doesn't like that RAM. All right, I decided to shake hands with danger and get that RAM out of there. And I swapped in eight sticks that pretty closely match each other. So let's see if that makes this thing any happier. There we go. Guess it needed a matched set. I forgot how sensitive SIM RAM was to being unmatched. All right, let's do a ghetto DOS install on that hard drive. There we go. Okay, I really wanna see how Doom performs on a 386DX with a Mathco. I know it's probably gonna be terrible, but I wanna see it for myself. Time to do a good old fashioned install of Doom from floppy disks. All right, let's see how unplayable this is. <laughs> it's a slideshow. Let's see what it'll take to get it playable. Let's try low graphics details. Still a slideshow. Let's shrink that screen size down a little. <laughs> Let's go all the way down. Hey, there we go. <laughs> I don't know which pixel I want to aim at. Let's switch back to high detail. Oh, that's not too bad. I just had to get the 386DX Doom experience. Alright, well I actually ended up falling in love with this system. It's a very interesting example of a very small time clone manufacturer. And this case is actually pretty nice. I'll just have to see what can be done about that paint on the top. The hard drive's a little too quiet for my liking, but hey, we got a fully functional system here. And this is the first system from that hall with the 387DX. Yeah, I definitely love it. Alright, well all three of these systems actually really surprised me. Especially this 486VLB. That is something I was definitely not expecting to be in this case. And that motherboard is most certainly not staying in that case. That's definitely going in either a baby AT tower or maybe a case that's similar to this one. At least a full height card where we can insert the cards vertically. But all three of these systems definitely contain treasures. And as always, I'd like to give a huge thanks to everyone who's subscribed and pledged their support on Patreon. And a very special thanks to James for sending me the desoldering gun. That thing has definitely improved my repair process. And if you're new to the channel and you like what you see, I'm doing stuff like this all the time, so be sure to subscribe. This is not even the only set of mystery pizza box style systems that I have to go through. And there's still work to be done on these systems. I'm just a little bit short on time this week. We definitely need some better cleanup and I need to figure out what to do about this paint. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.